And all three of the books, the two this week and the one next week, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, are post-exilic books, meaning after the exile. Uh, the Babylonian exile, we talked about some last week, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of that history today in terms of not, not uh, just what happened, but what happened after, because that's what these books are about, and that's why they're called post-exilic. They are after the Babylonian exile. Um, of course, we look at this every week. We're, we're looking, talking right now about the historical books. Um, next term, which starts in April, it's April and May, we are looking at the wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, as it's sometimes called. Um, so that will be our last section. All the rest of this we've already dealt with. The, the Torah, the books of the law, the, and the prophets, we've had classes on. They're available online. Okay? Now, let's talk about the Babylonian exile a little bit more and in preparation for understanding what happened after the exile, which was um, potentially one of the most important parts, um, or possibly one of the most important parts of Jewish history, because it reestablished the Jews as the chosen people of God after they had fallen to the place that they thought maybe they weren't anymore. This, of course, is the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. This is the Babylonian Empire that was under uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar, the name that you probably know best, uh, Nebuchadnezzar of the Book of Daniel, um, and of the recent books, the historical books we've studied, and especially Nebuchadnezzar, while he may not appear in person, he, he is behind the scenes leading up to everything that we talk, we're talking about today. So the Babylonian Empire covered all of the Mesopotamian region, all of the Levant, as it's called, this area here, all of the, um, the Fertile Crescent, all the way down to the Arabian Desert. So it had taken over everything the Assyrians had. It defeated Egypt. It became the power. All right, now let's talk about that a little bit. When the Babylonians um, defeated the Assyrians, it left only two major powers in the world. Assyria had been sort of friends with Egypt. They were kind of slowly in, you know, they, they got along for a while tentatively. But then when Assyria started declining, e uh, Egypt actually came all the way up. In fact, let me come back to this. Egypt had come all the way up to the Euphrates River and had taken control of all of this once Assyria had weakened. In other words, they took a lot of the territory Assyria had. The reason why Egypt did that is because they saw the power of the Neo-Babylonian Empire rising and they were trying to preempt it. They were trying to take over part of the important territories that Assyria had and control them in order to keep the Babylonians from being even more powerful than they were afraid they were going to be. Well, it didn't work, okay? Um, in 605 BC, the Babylonians defeat the Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish. And this is very important. You remember King Josiah. King Josiah was one of the very best of all of the kings. He uh, was the great-grandson of um, Hezekiah, who had been a good king of, the, of Judah. Josiah came along and really did more than any other king to get rid of the false the worship of false gods, to reestablish the nation of Israel as a, as a country that worshipped only the one true God. Well, um, at that point, the, the Assyrians had been such a danger and such a problem that when Egypt came up and was taking part of that territory, Josiah marched out from Jerusalem with the army of Israel to try to do battle against the Egyptians, thinking, you guys are going to just turn the apple cart over. And so Josiah is killed in that battle, and because the Egyptians have marched north, uh, the Babylonians come over, and they, ha they have a major battle, the Battle of Carchemish, and the Egyptians are, are soundly defeated and driven back to uh, Egypt. Well, at that point, Josiah has just been killed, and Babylon takes over. The Babylonians take over all of this area, so they take over control of Judah. <clears throat> they march in, and the, the uh, Israelites in Jerusalem are not able at that point to really defend, you know, to defend themselves against this massive power, the Babylonians. And so the first of the deportation of the Jews from Israel occurs when they take some of the Jewish people from Jerusalem, take them off into captivity in Babylon. Now, among those that were taken away in this first deportation, and there actually are four deportations by the Babylonians of the Jews back to Babylon, um, and this 
first deportation included Daniel and his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, who, what names do we usually know Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or shake a bed, make a bed, and a bed to go. Carolyn, <laughs> you're going to go. Yes, Bob. In one of the Bible studies this week, we learned that their real names were Shamrock, Meshach, and Abednego. Shamrock. I guess that's one of the Irish Hebrews. <laughs> exactly. It's one of the Irish Hebrews. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe deep. In the love, out with the jive. In the love, out with the jive. Okay, so in this first deportation, after the Babylonians have defeated the Egyptians, and they now control Israel. Now, they don't destroy the city. They simply take some of the people off, and Israel at this point becomes a, um, a client nation, as it's sometimes called, which means... They were, they were left alone, they were left to be independent, but they had to pay taxes. They had to pay tribute to Babylon. Well, Egypt had not been completely destroyed. Egypt was still there, and so this is the start of the time where there's a teeter-totter going on between is Egypt the most powerful or is Babylon the most powerful? And within Israel, especially in the city of Jerusalem, two parties grew up. One of them was pro-Egyptian and kept thinking it's only a matter of time until Egypt becomes powerful enough to defeat the Babylonians, and since they didn't want to pay tribute to the Babylonians, they were felt oppressed by the Babylonians, they wanted the Egyptians to arise. There were others who felt like they were being pragmatic and saying, stay away from the Egyptians or you're going to get us in trouble with Nebuchadnezzar again. So stop that. And so they had these two parties that vied for power. By 599, so we're only looking at six years later or so, the pro-Egyptian party had taken and come to greater power in Jerusalem, and they revolt against the Babylonian rule. When they revolt against the Babylonian rule, Nebuchadnezzar comes sweeping again. He siege, laid siege to Jerusalem. He pillages the city this time. He does more damage, but doesn't destroy the walls or the temple at this point. He deports King Je Jehoiakim and his court into Babylon. Jehoiakim ended up staying for 27 years as a prisoner in Babylon before he was finally released. I think it was 27 years. And also, in this deportation, they included the prophet Ezekiel. Because they took the king, Jehoiakim, uh, who's also called Jeconiah. You may see that name sometimes. It's the same person. Jehoiakim, Jeconiah, and his court, the prophet Ezekiel, are taken off into Babylon into captivity. And then they did a little more damage that time. They pillaged the city. Well, still you had these powers. Uh, and, and when they left, when they took Jeconiah, um, Jehoiakim off, they put his uncle um, his king, in as king. His name was Zedekiah. And so King Zedekiah is put into power by the Babylonians. But again, they're not real keen on being under the thumb of Babylon. So 10 years later, they think that Egypt has gotten more powerful again. King Zedekiah uh, puts together an alliance with Pharaoh Hora of Egypt, and they revolt again against the Babylonians, thinking the Egyptians are going to be able to protect them. Well, Nebuchadnezzar still king in Babylon. Uh, the Babylonians soundly defeat Egypt, in fact, end up taking over control of Egypt. When you saw the map that included Egypt, it was after that last battle, they really controlled all of Egypt. They defeated Egypt, they came to the city, and Nebuchadnezzar said, that's enough. I'm tired of you guys every seven to ten years revolting, you know, the peasants are revolting, you know, rebelling against me, and so I'm going to put an end to this. And so he, they besieged the city, and after almost a year, they destroy the walls of the city, they destroy the temple of Jerusalem, and they carry a third group of Israelites from Jerusalem off into exile. So that's the third deportation. When they destroyed the city walls, when they destroyed the temple, they then put a governor in place whose name is Gedaliah. Gedaliah is the... Um, He's actually Jewish. He's a Judite, and he's from Judah. Uh, but they put him in as governor. And then, just a few years later, a member of the previous royal family, meaning, meaning related to Jeconiah, of the line of David, in other words, assassinates Gedaliah and assassinates his Babylonian advisors. Because Gedaliah was appointed by the Babylonians, but he had Babylonian advisors. They were still in control. 
This guy kills Gedalia, kills his advisors. Nebuchadnezzar comes back, and or his generals. You know, he didn't have to be there in person. And they carried off the last bunch into captivity. Now, when I say the last bunch, the estimates are that they probably never carried off more than 25% of the total population of Judah. At the time of the start of all this, the population of Judah was thought to be around 75,000 based upon, you know, we obviously have a lot of lists of names and things. And based upon the lists of the exiles, it's believed that they probably took about a quarter of those people off in exile. Now that's a quarter of the whole of Judah, that is the nation. They probably took far more than that, you know, took a predominant percentage, a larger percentage than, than half of the people of Jerusalem off into captivity, because they were the royal family, they were the priests, they were the ones that were important. But there were still people there to work the land. There were still people. In fact, when Gedaliah takes over as governor, one of the things he tries to do is to convince Jews to come back to Judah from Moab and Ammon and other surrounding countries, and he tries to sort of repopulate the city of Jerusalem before he's assassinated. And then all those who came back to Jerusalem and Gedaliah's encouragement get carried off into captivity by the Babylonians. So that didn't work out so well. But this idea of repopulating Jerusalem ends up happening later on under Nehemiah as well. So this is what the Jews have experienced. And they, four different times, the Babylonians come in and take them up into captivity. And every time they think the Egyptians are going to be strong enough to defend them, it, they prove not sufficient to defeat the armies of the Babylonians, okay? So as we said, in 586, 587, 586, the final uh, siege and destruction of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar, and the carrying off of the, that's the largest single deportation, all right? Um, and by the way, when Gedaliah is killed, the governor is killed and his advisors, a bunch of the people from Jerusalem who know that Nebuchadnezzar is not going to put up with that, they leave and run off to uh, Egypt. And it's believed that Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, was, was in that group. And that's, that's where he ended up, is, having, is going off, and probably not even by his own volition. He, they probably literally said, you are going with us because you're a prophet of God, you know, and we, we don't want all the connections we can get. And so they took him off into captivity or into exile into Egypt with them. Egypt, throughout the whole history of Israel, had been the place of refuge. You will remember that when Jacob was alive and had the 12 sons and there was a famine, where did they go to get food? Egypt, and they just happened to find out that one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, was already there and in charge. Uh, when Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus are threatened by Herod the Great, where did they run off to? Egypt. Egypt. And so there had always been a sense in which Egypt was a, it was a place of refuge, and there were always a lot of Jews in Egypt. In fact, um, after the defeat of Persia by Alexander the Great, when he goes down and, and sets up Alexandria as a city, at one point, um, more than a third of the population of Alexandria was Jews. There was a, always a large Jewish population in Egypt because of that sort of you know, connection, all right? But it didn't help them when it came to battle with the Babylonians. The interesting thing, though, is that you will remember we talked about Assyria, and when Assyria took the people off into captivity, they forced them to intermarry with other peoples, they displaced them, you know, spread them out, they didn't leave them together. Um, they were pretty ruthless about that. The Babylonians, when they took people off into deportation, they pretty much kept them together. Um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego continued to be friends, even though they were in the capital city of Babylon. There were communities of Jews, so when it came time for them to go back, they were still, they still had a sense of being a people. They still were a community. Now, and it was only 50 or so years between the, you know, the, the deportation and then the defeat of Babylon by, by the Persians, okay? Um, we looked at this last week, but I want to just remind you that the Babylonian uh, exile, the deportation into Babylon, really affected the Jewish people. When we say the Jewish people at this point, we only mean the people of Judah and Benjamin. Because all the northern tribes became the lost tribes because the Assyrians defeated the northern kingdom of Israel and took those people off and pretty much annihilated them. I mean, and not necessarily kill them, but annihilated them as a people by, by spreading them out, by having them intermarry, etc. Um, you had some Samaritans, which were Jews that were intermarried with other peoples living in the north, and they became a problem when, during the, the return uh, under uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. But for the most part, we're only talking about the Jews who were from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin that were left in the southern kingdom of Judah. That's where the word Jew comes from, Judah. 
because after the Babylonian exile, well, after the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom in 722, everybody was thought of as a member of Judah, and so Judah became Jews. In fact, in German, it's Jude. In, in Spanish, it's similar to that, right? Jude? Judeo. Judeo? Judeo. So, all of that linked to the base word Judah. Okay? So, the people were left wondering if God still loved them and if they were still his special people. They were unsure how to be the people of God when the things that most represented their election as God's people, that is the promised land and the temple, had been either taken away or destroyed. They did not know how to worship God without a temple. You can't have sacrifice without a temple. The idea was the presence of God resided there. How do we communicate with God? How do we relate to God? How do we worship if we don't know where he is? We don't have a temple anymore. And then they were fearful, early on especially, of being assimilated and losing their uniqueness as a people, which is exactly what had happened in the northern kingdom of Israel when Assyria had conquered, Assyria had conquered them 138 years before. Um, as I said last week, this is one of the reasons for the rise of importance, not the invention of, but the rise in the importance of the synagogue as a local place where they, they couldn't sacrifice animals, they couldn't worship in that sense, but they could pray and they could study. This is when study became such a major focus of the, of the Jewish people. And they could see that as a community center where they celebrated religious uh, festive, you know, religious events like uh, bar mitzvahs and circumcisions and all of those kinds of things. And where they could gather as a people to keep their identity as a people because they did not want to happen to them what had happened to the northern tribes when Assyria destroyed them. Okay? Then, of course, as we said, along comes the Persian Empire. A huge empire, all of going all the way over to the Indus Valley, the Indus River Valley, so take all the way over into pa all of Pakistan and part of India. Um, all of Asia Minor, what had been the Hittite Empire, what we know of as Turkey, all the way over into Macedonia and parts of Greece. In fact, that and the fact that there were cities all along the coast here of the Aegean Sea that saw themselves as Greek, but they were controlled by the Persians, that's what got under Philip of Macedon's, the burr under his saddle. And the reason they hated the Persians so much, the fact that Persia had burned Athens at one point, uh, that there had been, you know, the long per Greek Persian War had gone on. Uh, history was invented by Herodotus in writing about the history of the Greek and Persian Wars. So it was as Persia was growing up and up and up and up and taking over this, that's when the Persian War had happened. This is what Philip of Macedon hated the Persians for, and that's what his son Alexander, why his son Alexander, when he took over the army after his father Philip of Macedon was uh, assassinated, Alex, Alexander took over the army, and his plan from the very first was to come across and initially probably just take back Asia Minor. Well, he was so darn successful at it, you know, an army of 40,000 people several times defeated an army of over 200,000 people, uh, that he said, why stop here? <laughs> and he, you know, he continued, went through, down through the Levant, through Israel as we know it, into Egypt, conquering all along the way, and then cut across, ended up all the way over, you know, over into India, and after 10 years, as I've said before, his, his soldiers said, ow, 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 let's go home, that's enough. He wanted to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. He wanted to keep going to the Great Waters. But he finally reached the point where he knew his troops were at the point of mutiny if he didn't turn around and come back. And then he died um, on the way back. Okay, anyway, this was the Persian Empire, the largest empire to date, uh, as of that period of time, the largest empire that had ever existed. Okay? Then, and this is Cyrus the Great, the one who made all of that happen for them. It's these images from the, uh, from the Persian. Now, let's talk about the return of the Jews from that Babylonian captivity. This is what these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, are about. Okay? I know I have a particular affinity for history, but it really is valid here. Okay? Um, in 539, the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians under Cyrus the Great. And if you read the book of Daniel, it's in there. Uh, the Belshazzar, who was the grandson, it says the son of, of Nebuchadnezzar, but they just means he's a descendant of, he was the grandson, is having this big festival, this big party, and he decides to get the utensils that were taken out of the temple in Jerusalem and have all his, his drinking buddies and concubines and everybody drinking out of this stuff. The hand of God shows up and the finger of God writes and Daniel interprets it. 
And it said, this very night, the kingdom, your kingdom will be required of you. Well, that night, historically, was the night that the um, Persians under Cyrus the Great defeated the Babylonian Empire. Okay. And the history, the piece of history dovetail there in terms of what we know from other sources in the biblical record. So, 539, Cyrus the Great, the Persian, conquers the Babylonian Empire, and in the first year, he issues a decree that allows all the captive people in the empire that he now controls to go home, and particularly, he allows the, he gives the Jews instructions that they are to rebuild the temple. Now, if you, in your book, um, not under Ezra and Nehemiah, but um, the chapter before that, there is actually a photograph, I should have marked this, a photograph of a thing called the Cylinder of Cyrus. Do you see that? Well, the Cylinder of Cyrus, this thing, it's on page five, uh, 258. It actually is a record from that time, which, and they, they used to put things on cylinders like this. Um, it's a record of the fact that Cyrus allowed the conquered peoples in the Persian Empire to return to their homes and to give them freedom of worship. It, it's not specific to the Jews, but that tells us that that was what Cyrus did, and therefore it's completely consistent with what we read in the book of Ezra, that Jesus gave them instructions to go home and to build a temple to the Lord their God. Cyrus had a very different idea than the Assyrians and the Babylonians did. He thought, if I treat these people well and give them more freedoms and allow them to return to their homelands, then they're not, they're not going to hate me like they hated the Babylonians, or they hated the Assyrians even worse, and they'll, you know, I won't have problems with them. And for the most part, he continued to have pretty much peace with the conquered peoples that he had, um, up until Alex. Alexander, he didn't care for him. So, 539, everything changes. The next year, or within the first year, the first Jews return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel. Now, there's an interesting little thing. If you read, depending on the translation, you'll read that Cyrus entrusted all of the vessels from the Hebrew temple that had been taken away by Nebuchadnezzar to Shezbazar, prince of Judah. And we read about Shezbazar, and then all of a sudden, no more Shezbazar, we've got Zerubbabel who was the governor and the one who's rebuilding the temple. There's three different possible explanations for that. Um, either Shezbazar and Zerubbabel are the same person, because you'll remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a Babylonian name and they had a, a Hebrew name. It may be that one of these is the Babylonian name for the same guy, and the other Zerubbabel is the, is, we don't know that uh, for sure. Either the same person, or it's possible Shezbazar was in fact Shenazar, who was Zerubbabel's uncle, and therefore part of the line of David, or it was two different people. And Shezbazar was in charge for a while, and he was older, and then Zerubbabel took over. The point is that it calls him, in the scripture, it calls him the Prince of Judah, which would have meant that he was one of the royal family, he was descendant of David. And we know that was true of Zerubbabel, so it's, it's possible they were the same person. There are a couple of places where it seems to indicate, you know, different different passages because Ezra and Nehemiah overlap each other. You know, they, they cover some of the same events um, in terms of an overlap. And originally, they were one book. This is one of those places where Ezra and Nehemiah was one book in the Hebrew Bible. It's still one book in the Hebrew Bible. It wasn't until the third century when they were translating it into, you know, the Septuagint, the, the Hebrew Bible into Greek that they decided it was too much for one book and they broke it up in two. And the simple reason for that is because Hebrew doesn't take up as much space as Greek does. Greek has all, all the vowels in it, and, and Hebrew doesn't have any written vowels. And so um, they broke it up into two, Ezra and Nehemiah. But the first of the Jews returned, all of them had the freedom to return at that point. That's what we were talking about. Any of them could have gone back because the king of the Persian Empire had said you can return if you want. But Zerubbabel, who's commissioned by the king, or, you know, uh, Shezbazar, depending on who, I, I tend to believe they're the same person, um, is commissioned to go back and rebuild the temple and take back these, these valuable articles from the temple. He returns uh, the people with him, they restore the altar and the foundations of the temple. So they start working on rebuilding the temple. But they're very slow. Nehemiah's not on site, and so they're going very slow at this thing. By 525, work on the temple halts because of local opposition. 
It's especially true that they were opposed by um, some of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were the interbred people, intermarried people. They were not fully Jewish. They were part Jewish and part something else. They lived more in the north. When they first returned, the, uh, the Samaritans had said, we'll help you rebuild your temple. And they went, no, <laughs> you're, you're not fully Jewish anymore. And so you can't have a part in this. Well, as a result, they actively opposed them. It started out with it just being the Samaritans opposing them. Later on, they had problems with the Samaritans and the people from Arabia and the Philistines and the Moabites, a bunch of different people getting in trouble under Nehemiah when Nehemiah was trying to rebuild the city. But initially, the problem was with the Samaritans when they were trying to rebuild the temple. Um, during this same period of time, we have three prophets working. There is Haggai, um, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those are the post-exilic prophets. And Haggai especially, when they stop building on the temple and they're all basically relaxing and enjoying fairly leisurely life, Haggai gets after them and says, you people are living in your houses paneled with wood and the temple of God is sitting idle, not being built yet. Get on it! All right? And he really jumps on them. And it has an effect. Haggai and Zechariah really pushed them to rebuild the temple. They get to work, and in 515, the temple rebuilding is completed. And that's in the sixth year of the Persian king, Darius I. So we have a series of, uh, Darius I was actually, the, I think, the fourth king in the Persian Empire. Then in 458, Ezra leads a second return of exiles to Jerusalem and begins teaching the law. Ezra was a priest and a scribe. He goes back. In each case, in fact, some people see a cycle, a sequence of events here. The, a Persian king will be moved by God to do something, and he will pick somebody, one of the Israelites, and commission them and equip them and send them back to Jerusalem to do the good work. There'll be opposition, then they will succeed. Then we have it again. So first we had uh, Cyrus picking Zerubbabel, you know, inspired by God to build the temple, picking Zerubbabel, sending him back to start the temple. They had opposition, it didn't work, and then finally they re rebuilt the temple, they completed it under Darius. Then you have Ezra comes along, and Xerxes is the king then. Xerxes is moved by God to uh, make sure that the Israelites that return are worshiping their God. And this is an interesting thing. If you read the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar comes to believe in the one true God. And then at one point when he's so prideful that he denies him, then God makes him insane. He goes nuts, and not until he realizes there really is only one true God does he gain his sanity back. And it was after the whole Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the temple of you know, the burning, the, the uh, fiery furnace, that he recognized that their God was the true God. That you have the same thing that happened with the Ninevites under Jonah. You have the same thing happening with some of the Persian kings. That even though they worshipped other gods, they go through periods of time where one or the other of them will acknowledge the fact that there seems to be something special about this Jewish God. So Xerxes sends Ezra back with the commission to take more refugees, more of the exiles, back, and also make sure that they're staying on track in terms of reclaiming their Jewishness, meaning being obedient to the law, remembering their history and all of that. So Ezra, the priest and scribe, goes back for the purpose of teaching the law and then correcting some failings that the people had in which they were not obedient to the law, especially having to do with marrying foreign women which they were not supposed to do. That's what, that's what got them in trouble all over the place. That's what Solomon did wrong, you know, and on and on. Yes? You, you said Ezra was a priest and scribe? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and so he goes back, begins teaching the law, and begins to correct some of the ways in which they've gone wrong. They've gone off track. Then, more than a decade after that, Nehemiah is cupbearer to another Persian king, Artaxerxes I. There's some scholars who believe that it was actually Artaxerxes the second or the third, but the first makes more sense in terms of the timeline. He's the cupbearer to Artaxerxes. It means, he, it means he's sort of his butler, but a cupbearer was a very trusted person because he literally was the one who brought you your wine, and if you didn't want to get poisoned, you wanted a guy in that job who you could trust. So he was a, he was a Jew, but he was very much trusted by Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes, one day,
Hey, Nehemiah has got a report from his brother who's returned from Jerusalem, and he said it's a horrible situation back there. The walls are down, bandits are coming in, people are attacking them, they can't get anything done. Um, and so Nehemiah is really troubled by this. You know, he's really troubled, and he prays and he prays, and he is so troubled by it that one day the king, Artaxerxes, says, Nehemiah, what is wrong with you? I've never seen you look downcast before, and yet you look like somebody shot your dog. That's the southern translation of what he said. Um, and he said, well, I'm greatly troubled because my city, Jerusalem, you know, the land of my forefathers, uh, is in great trouble. And I would like to go back and, and fix the problem. And Artaxerxes and his queen say, how long will it take? And he says, well, you know, and he says, go. I commission you to go. I'll write an edict. And he wrote an official edict and said, you go back and you can have all the materials you need to rebuild the walls. And so he did so, went back, and in 52 days from the time they started, they rebuilt the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And then 334 B.C., or right about there, sometime between 330 and 336, um, Alexander the Great conquers Persia. And it all starts all over again. That's where all the whole Hellenized Jew and the Greek influence and all that comes from. But that gives you a little bit of history in terms of what was happening at the time of the return. This, from this point on to here, is what is covered in Ezra and Nehemiah. So the history is basically 100 years, from about 538 to somewhere around uh, 438 B.C. Now this chart, which I've shown you before, it shows the prophets, it shows the kings. You know, here we have uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. The, the prophets here, the kings of the, the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel. This is the period Daniel and Ezekiel are prophesying during the time of the Babylonian captivity. That's immediately prior to what we're looking at. Then you have Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah are the leaders of the people. And the prophets at that time are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, as I told you. This is the post-exilic, after the Babylonian exile. So this chart's online. Uh, I think this is a really valuable, very cool kind of one, you know, one-shot uh, picture of what this is all about. Okay. Recognizing that Ezra and Nehemiah was one book originally, and while the, 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 there's overlap inside, you know, it goes forward, then it comes back and sort of describes, it, it, it starts out, what we have is the book of Ezra, starts out, and it's really two halves. Um, the first six books have to do with the first return under Zerubbabel of the, of the Hebrew exiles and of the first efforts to rebuild the temple. And then the second half of the book is the part where Ezra shows up and starts preaching the law, teaching the law, and preaching reform. You then get to Nehemiah, and you have the first part where Nehemiah returns and uh, begins rebuilding the walls. Then it starts talking about Ezra's efforts to, in teaching the law and sort of recovery, and then we come back to Nehemiah and his reforms. You have Ezra's reforms, you have Nehemiah's reforms, because after being there for 12 years, and I'm sure Artaxerxes and these guys are going, whatever happened to old uh, <laughs> Nehemiah? Um, after 12 years of being in Jerusalem, Nehemiah goes back to Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire, and this, Susa is the city where Esther takes place. We'll look at her next week in that story. But he goes back to Susa, and he's there for a while, and when he comes back, they've done all, they've messed up all sorts of stuff. They've got, they've got one guy who's, you know, who's set up a man cave in the temple, um, you know, is living there, Tobiah, um, and he has to chase him out. They've started intermarrying with non-Jewish women again, and he's got to deal with that one. Uh, just all kinds of problems, all right, that, that during his second administration, as they call it, we'll talk about that. Uh, but let's look, even though that's all sort of one long story, Let's look at them separately because we can, you know, there's a bit easier to bite off and chew. The book of Ezra. We believe, we being traditional scholars, uh, more traditional in our viewpoint, that the books of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, and Ezra and Nehemiah, which of course were only two books originally, not four, were written by Ezra, the priest and scribe. The scribe part of it means he wrote things down for a living. And so we believe he wrote it. There are some people who believe that there was a school of people that, that probably started with Ezra and may have continued after him. There are some who say, oh no, it's just bits and pieces of this and that. Well, I don't buy it. I think that Ezra either is the author or was the predominant author. If there are other people that got anointed to help complete the job, 
because it covers a long, you know, it covers almost 100 years, then that's okay. You know, God anointed other people. But I believe that it bears the mark. There's enough similarities between Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah to believe that they were from the same author and then covering, you know, the, the period that led up to the exile and then the period after the exile. Um, so again, it's about a hundred year period that, the, that it covers. The theme is the return and rebuilding of the temple, but actually, you know, I wrote this a while back during a survey class, and I might change that now. I think the theme almost is the reestablishing of the Hebrews as, as the people of God. Because it's more than just the building of the temple. That really was the thing that was the, you know, that's what they hung everything else on, so to speak. But it had to do with teaching the law. It had to do with getting them to be obedient to what they'd been taught, particularly with regard to marrying foreign women and that sort of stuff. Uh, participating in the Passover, which they'd stopped doing. You know, they have a Feast of the Tabernacles as a major festival they celebrate when, they, when they're working on the temple, uh, which they had not been practicing for a long time in some of the major feasts. And so it's more than just the temple. It has to do with reestablishing them as the people of God, obedient to the things of God. The temple simply is the locus, the location where that takes place. The purpose to show that God is faithful to the remnant. Um, these are seen as prophetic books in the sense that they're not just pure history. You know, our, our Christian titles or our English um, categories, we call them history books. And that's why we're studying them all together. But in fact, these are seen as prophetic books in the Hebrew canon. And the reason for that is because... It, these are seen primarily as a uh, prophetic fulfillment of God's promise. Remember, a prophet isn't just somebody who tells the future. A prophet is someone who speaks for God. And the idea is that by the very events and actions that are portrayed here, God's voice is being heard in terms of his fulfilling his covenant promises to his people. And so it really is to show that God is faithful to his promises. He has not forgotten. He does not forget. He will keep his promise, even though it may take a while, and even though the days can look dark before it gets there. He will come through and fulfill what he said he was going to do. All right? Outline the exile's return, the rebuilding of the temple, the ministry of Ezra. Or, as I said before, you can think of it in two halves. The first part is the, is the temple, uh, the return and the building of the temple, and then the arrival and ministry of Ezra is the second part. Okay? Any questions about that? This is something I used to do in classes and haven't done in a long time, and it seemed appropriate to me with the history emphasis here. Um, major parallels in world history. And I think this is valuable, and I'm sorry I haven't been doing it in some of the other history classes, but, uh, because it, I think it does give us a sense that this is really rooted in time uh, and real events. Ezra covers the 100-year period, as I said. Um, 539 or 538, right in there. Um, Cyrus the Great of Persia conquers Babylonia. We can say act on October 12th because we actually do have identification in Scripture of what the day in the, in the Jewish calendar was. The 13th day of Adar, I think it is, or 17th day or something like that. Then, uh, within a year, it's in the, it says, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, meaning the first year after he conquered Babylonian, the Babylonians, he decrees that the Jews in captivity may return to Jerusalem. Then 10 years later, Buddha gains enlightenment in India, just to give you, you know, a historical perspective. Um, then in 515, the Jerusalem temple is rebuilt. That's the completion of the temple by the returning exiles. Again, it took a long time because they stopped for a long time. 490, the Greeks defeat the Persians in the Battle of Marathon. Now again, remember, the Persians have conquered all this area, but they're still having battles. The Persians... You will notice that from that map I had, it marked part of Macedonia, just a little tiny bit of Greece. Well, the next next thing for the Persians to try to do in, in terms of conquering, which is what empires did back then, was to try to conquer the rest of Greece. And the Greeks were nothing at that point. The Greeks were a, a collection of city-states. They weren't even a nation. And for them to be battling the Persian Empire at that point in time very much was a David and Goliath kind of situation. And that's why the defeat of the Persian army by the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon was so extraordinary. And, of course, you remember the story that the, the runner, the Greek runner, ran 26 miles from the plains of Marathon to the city of Athens to report that the Persians had been conquered and then he fell over dead. I, I would make it 26 miles. <laughs> but that's where we get the Marathon, the Marathon race. It's because of the Battle of Marathon, okay? And the 26 miles that he ran in. Starts with a T. Yes, John. 
Question. Um, was that uh, during Philip's reign or his son? That was That's before. Before, uh, before Philip? Yeah. Philip comes along in, in the mid-300s, and then Alexander the Great conquers the known world starting about 336. Okay? So this is 150 years before that. Um, yes, Bob? You could also throw Confucius in there. In the right. He was about 500. Yeah. In fact, if you, want, if you want to look at the growth of religious... Uh, major world religions, the 6th century BC was like <laughs> crazy. You know, you had Lao Tzu, you had Confucius, you had uh, Buddha, you had all this stuff right in a relatively short period of time, especially the Asian religions. Yeah, there's a lot of other stuff we can throw in here. I just wanted to give you kind of a you know, couple of points. And then 447 to 432, the Parthenon Temple in Athena is built, in, uh, to Athena is built in Athens. That's the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis. Okay? This is the golden age. After the Greeks succeeded, you know, the Persians actually burned Athens at one point, and then the, they, they ended up driving the Persians back. You, it's, it's in here, too, during one of the Persian attempts to conquer, uh, conquer Greece that you have the 300, you know, the, the Battle of Thermopylae, where the Spartans, and it wasn't just the Spartans, there were Thebans and others there, but the Spartans got all the credit because they were the most you know, militant where they defeated in a narrow, a narrow gap uh, this massive, you know, like million, I don't remember exactly, but it was close to a million man army of the Persians because they fought them in a gap where the, the numbers didn't help. You know, you can only get so many people into a place at one time, and when you're outnumbered, you want to fight in a narrow gap. And that's what they did at Thermopylae, and they held them up long enough for the Athenians and others to get organized and get prepared to, to fight them. So all of this, was leading up to the golden age of Greece, which was in the 5th century, the, the building of the Acropolis, uh, this is the time of Pericles as the leader of Greece and all of that, okay? Um, just to let you see that this occurred in the context of other historical events. Now, outline of Ezra and Nehemiah. And let's take a break for a few minutes, and so we'll come back and do this outline, and then talk about Nehemiah a little bit more. Let's look uh, fairly quickly at an outline of Ezra and Nehemiah, and We'll deal with these separately. I put Ezra and Nehemiah because we never want to forget that it was one book originally. But uh, we'll deal with these as two separate pieces uh, because it's just easier to take about out of them at that point. Um, first, as we said, the start of Ezra, and one of the reasons too why we think that Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah were written by the same person is the ending of Chronicles is repeated at the start of Ezra. So we will, there's an indication there that these were intended to be. Uh, Continuous to one another, contiguous to one another, because of the fact that the ending of one is, is, is the start of the other. So we have first the Edict of Cyrus the Great, and then the return of the first exiles under Shezbazar Zerubbabel. As I say, it starts out talking about uh, Shezbazar, the Prince of Judah, and later on we stop hearing about Shezbazar and we hear about Zerubbabel. I'm of the inclination they are the same person, because people had multiple names back then, and they were referred to different names at different times. Um, Sort of like reading a Russian novel. You never know. You go, well, this sounds a lot like that other guy. You know, and it's the same person, but they use different names depending upon the context. Then we have the list of returning exiles. These books, two books or one book, depending on how you look at it, Ezra and Nehemiah, there are several places where they list the exiles. And then Nehemiah later finds, um, the refines the list that had been misplaced, apparently, of the original exiles that had come uh, with Zerubbabel. And so we have a, a, recant, a recapping of that information. Then we have the revival of temple worship. Now this happens, revival of temple worship happens actually before the temple is rebuilt because the first thing they do is they rebuild the altar so that they can offer sacrifice. Then they, they celebrate the festival of tabernacles because it happens to be that time of year. And as I said, it's not just a matter of rebuilding the temple, it's a matter of reestablishing the religious practice and reestablishing themselves as God's people, the, the Jews, in observance of what God has told them. Then they begin the temple reconstruction. They very quickly run into opposition to the building, and they have opposition in, in, in all three of the reigns that get referred to, uh, leading up to the prior to Darius. Opposition during the reign of Cyrus, opposition during the reign of Xerxes, opposition during the reign of Artaxerxes. And, they keep various people there who don't want the Jews to rebuild the temple, to reestablish themselves there. 
will write back to the king and say, you do know that these people have a history of rebelling against, who, against whoever their king is, and you know they're really awful people, and you really don't want to let them get away with this, and they keep having to respond to that. Of course, Cyrus had written an edict that said, not only did they have permission, but he was commissioning them to go and would provide them support. But we have record of, of opposition all along the way uh, during under the various kings here. Um, and we initially it was the Samaritans, that is the half-Jews, that were uh, against it because the Jews had not been open to them involving themselves in the rebuilding of the temple from the start. And then later on, various other peoples get involved in it. We then have the completion of the temple. They resume the work under Darius. Then there is a, a new beginning inspired by Haggai and Zechariah. I told you that they it sort of sloughed off. They weren't working on the temple, and the prophets come along and really kick them in the backside and say, you know, what's wrong with you? They then get an intervention by the local governor, Tatanai, who is against them rebuilding. And he communicates back to Darius and says they shouldn't be doing this. And the report comes to him that, well, Cyrus the Great, you know, your predecessor, issued an edict making this not only possible, but a requirement. Well, they look for it. Uh, they send a report back to Darius, and Darius searches for the decree of Cyrus, and they find it in the records, the annals. Of course, they, you know, they didn't have Pentaflex folders, and so it's a little harder to find stuff back then. If it was, if it was you know, particularly if it was carved on a clay tablet or something, you know, it takes a while to find this stuff. So when Darius uh, scholars found that Cyrus truly had issued an edict that this should be done, the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem, then Darius orders that the temple be rebuilt and that it be supported by the officials of the Persian government and with materials. And so they end up completing the temple, they dedicate the temple, and then they celebrate the Passover as the first religious practice. And you see this, Feast of the Tabernacles, celebrating the Passover, they're not just building a building. They're reinstituting the major celebrations, major festivals of the Jewish faith. Then the second half of this book starts with Ezra's return and reforms. Ezra returns to Jerusalem. It's introduced. Artaxerxes, who was king by then, uh, Artaxerxes authorizes Ezra's return. Um, we have a doxology. A doxology is a short song of praise by Ezra. You know, when we sing, praise God from whom all, from all nations, praise God from whom all <laughs> blessings <laughs> flow. I'm talking about nations. For blessings flow, I have to actually sing it to know it. Um, that's a short song of praise. It's a doxology. So we have Ezra's doxology. We have a list of those who are returning with Ezra. So this is the second return. The first return was under Zerubbabel. The second return under Ezra. Well, when Ezra goes back there as a priest, he recognizes that one of the problems they have is they don't have... Levites. They don't have people from the priestly tribe to help lead the temple worship and lead the religious training and all that sort of stuff. So he searches for Levites. They go into a time of prayer and fasting. There is an assignment of the sacred articles, some of the other sacred articles that have been taken from the temple that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had. They are, they are entrusted to people who are going with Ezra. They make the journey and arrive in Jerusalem. And then Ezra starts his reform. He gets there and he is astonished to find out that the Jews have done exactly what had caused all the problems with Solomon and so many other times, and that is they've intermarried with foreign, foreign women. Um, Ezra confesses the sins, and he includes himself in this, he confesses the sins of the Israelites. He prays to God and says, God, you know, give us the wisdom, lead us into right acts. And he calls the people together. The people respond and say, you know, you're right. We need to be obedient to God. Now, by this time, we've already begun to have Passover celebrated, the temple has been reestablished, etc. So there's kind of a, a foundation for them to do this. They call a, law, a complete public assembly. They investigate the offenders. Who is it that's actually done this? Married foreign women. And, and the suggestion is they've been involved in worshiping up the gods of those foreign women. They have the list of offenders, and they dissolve the mixed marriages. Now, they... Break, break them up and say, you can't be married to those people anymore. And it lists a couple of people who had it, took exception to that. But most of them agree. Most of them say, you're absolutely right. We should not have done this, and we need to stop. And people who say, well, that's not right, that they broke up all these marriages, the divorce rate is like 50%. We have all sorts of reasons for breaking up marriages. 
The fact that it's an offense to God is probably a good reason to break up a marriage. Okay? Yes? Okay, as so I was reading this, I thought, okay, uh, the women were sent away. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and what about the children? The children went with the women? Probably so, yes. And no, uh, but it doesn't say where they went or they We just, don't have a lot of details. No. Actually, I have from, from a... a First edition of King James Bible, because a lot of them were made. I have a page that is Ezra and Nehemiah. It's like it's where the two books um, and, and the passage, because it's the end of, of Ezra. You know, at the top they have a they'll have just a little phrase that, that encapsulates what's the theme on this page, and the, the phrase is "Who put away strange wives?" <laughs> <laughs> and so I have that because I thought Carolyn would appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, strange wise was the King James way of saying foreign women, women who were not uh, Jewish. Okay, um, a couple of verses that sort of I think give us the focus of Ezra, Ezra three ten and eleven. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. This gives you a sense of the importance, even though they've been in exile, and even though these were not the most obedient of Jews, since they, you know, a couple of times we have record in, in Ezra and Nehemiah that they wandered off in terms of marrying foreign women or, you know, stopping the building of the temple, etc. Still, they recognized when the foundation of the temple was relayed, the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians, the celebration is great because they recognized that this is not only the foundation of the building, but it represents the found, a, a new foundation for the Jewish people. Okay. And then Ezra 7, after these things during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, this Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given the king had granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. There's a fascinating passage in there that I was really struck by where it says that when they're getting ready to travel back, it was a pretty long journey from Babylon back to Jerusalem, that they got together and they prayed for protection because they did not feel on top of everything else he had promised the fact that they claimed that their God was the one true God, it wouldn't look good if they also asked for troops to protect them along the way. Because if the God couldn't protect them, what would that say? And so they simply prayed that God protect them, and they got there fine. But they, they, won. they were a little concerned as to how that might look. Okay? Let's look at Nehemiah now. Again, author Ezra Nehemiah, the idea that it probably was started by Ezra, but that Nehemiah may have picked it up. Yes, Marvin? Well, just go back to the strange weather for a second. <laughs> Ruth had the opportunity to come with Naomi and, and change to the, the faith. It's, well, I know it's not covered, but it's possible they could have went to the wives and said, would you like to become Jewish and yeah. so on and so forth? And if they said, no, we want to keep our gods and we want to keep our religion, then they said, well, we have to. Yeah. yeah, and we and we're not given a lot of detail about yeah. it. I mean, we don't know what all the discussion was in the process or anything else. We simply know that they had done something that they knew God did not want them to do, and that it created all kinds of problems before. From the very start, when they entered the land of Canaan, they were told, "Don't do this," and yet they had done it. So, what all of the particulars are, we don't know. But the people—it wasn't that they were, you know, tied up and forced to do this. The people recognized. We've done wrong. We need to change this. Um, and and there's, there's no indication, we don't know, but there's no indication that they didn't provide for the women that were sent away or anything else. So we don't know what, what that's about. So this is about a 25-year period of time from 445 to 420. The theme is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But again, it's more than that. It's establishing security that will allow the people of God, the Jews, to reestablish themselves as a nation. And again, the purpose is the same as Ezra, to show, to, to demonstrate that God is faithful to the remnant, to those who are obedient to him. Um, we have the return of Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the walls, then various threats and persecutions, renewal of the covenant, and then the dedication of the city and laws. Another way to look at that is that you have first the return of Nehemiah and the building, then you have the reform of Ezra, which comes in there, and then the reforms of Nehemiah, because Nehemiah then came along and, and affirmed the same problem. After Ezra, they had, and Nehemiah went back to Susa for a while, came back and they'd done the same thing. They were intermarrying with other peoples again. Um, 
the major parallels in history thing during this period of time. Uh, Nehemiah, butler, or cup, cupbearer, the Persian king, is appointed governor of Jerusalem, told to rebuild the walls. He rebuilds them in 52 days. This is the period of time, which is at the end of the Golden Age of Greece, where you have the Peloponnesian War, which is the war between Athens and Sparta. Uh, fascinating stories. Uh, Pericles, who was the head of Athens, the city-state of Athens, had them build a wall, which nobody was able to breach, all the way around not only the city of Athens, but all the way down to the port. If you've ever been to Athens, the port of Piraeus, yes. which has always been the port of Athens, is like 15 miles away or something. It takes you a half hour, 45 minutes to get from the, from the port to the city. Well, they built a wall around all of that so that they could get to the port. Um, Athens, the reason that was important to them, Athens was the major sea power in the world. Sparta didn't have much of an ocean, but they had a land army that nobody could defeat. So here you had the land army of Sparta attacking the walls of the city of Athens. The whole time Athens is getting in their ships and sailing around and you know, attacking port towns that, uh, that Sparta was supposed to be in control of. And neither one of them could get at the other because one of them was based on land and the other based on sea. Someone said it was like a, a, a war between an elephant and a whale. <laughs> um, so it's a, a fascinating period of time. And Pericles said, just hold out, just wait, just wait. But inside their wall, Athens, they had a plague. And Pericles was one of the victims of the plague. <laughs> And later on, they had other leaders who came up and said, okay, I'm tired of these guys standing outside our walls, let's go fight them. And Sparta ended up defeating Athens because they ended up trying to fight the kind of war that Sparta wanted to fight instead of the war that Pericles told them to fight. But, um, and after, after the end of the Golden Age, they were all looking around for somebody to blame, and one of the people they blamed was Socrates. They claimed him, they blamed him for uh, perverting their youth because he had questioned some of the, those new leaders after Pericles, Socrates was very, he was a race of guy, he was very blunt in telling everybody, including the students at his, at his school, that those people were idiots. And they accused him of, of uh, perverting the youth or misleading the youth and ended up forcing him to commit suicide. Which he probably didn't have to do, he probably could have gotten away from it, but he was making a point. <laughs> Maybe the last point he ever made. Okay, but you get an idea again that this happened in a historical context. A couple, I'll give you a couple of key verses and then we'll look at the outline. Uh, first part of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, who's cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, we read, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And right after that, the king Artaxerxes says, Nehemiah, what's wrong with you? And he tells him and gets permission to go back to Jerusalem. And then Nehemiah 6 says, So the walls were completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Okay? The astonishing organizing of Nehemiah. Let's look at the outline. Any questions about any of that before we look at the outline? Let's see where we're going with this, okay? I say Ezra and Nehemiah, but we're talking about Nehemiah specifically now. So we have two parts here. Nehemiah's first administration, or you can think of it in three parts. Nehemiah returning to Jerusalem in his first uh, responsibility as governor and rebuilding the, the walls. Then Ezra's reform is repeated uh, from the book of Ezra, and then Nehemiah's reforms. So first, Nehemiah hears about the plight of Jerusalem, and he prays to God that he be able to do, be allowed to do something about that. He then, the king asks him what's wrong with him, and he tells him, and the king gives him permission and Nehemiah then travels back with a, with a small group of people. Nehemiah did not take a large group of exiles back the way Zerubbabel had or Ezra had. Okay? There were some that went back with him at that point. There are others later. Nehemiah makes an effort to try to repopulate. But his first visit back to Jerusalem was not a major uh, repatriation of exiles. Then uh, Nehemiah, there's this very, it's a fascinating story. He gets to the city and... You get the sense it's almost like the first night he's there, he gets up way before daylight and takes his horse, rides his horse out, 
which is interesting because horses were military animals, and so, but he's a representative of the king, so he would have, you know, he'd have the ability to ride a horse. He rides out and he inspects the walls. He rides around the city and there are places it says he couldn't get through and so he had to track around, but he wants to see how bad it is. Then, and again, you get the feeling as though it's like the next day, he exhorts the people who are living there that they have responsibility to do something about this. That as long as they don't act to rebuild the walls, then they are going to continue to be victimized by these people who are attacking them. And they agree. And so Nehemiah then is very uh, adamant in terms of saying, if you don't like it, you know, there's the door or the hole in the wall or whatever. <laughs> that we are going to do this. And he deals with those who are saying, I, I don't think so. Now that's the initial opposition. Then he organizes the people into groups to rebuild sections of the wall. And he breaks it down. Northern section, uh, western section, southern section, eastern section. But with each of those, and it will say, such and such built from the, you know, the, this gate to the tower of blah blah right across from their house. So you almost get the feeling that people had responsibility for the section of the wall that was closest <laughs> to where they lived. So they had some ownership of it. That's part of the organization that he did. Uh, quite extraordinary. Well, once people realize that they're actually rebuilding the wall, they get opposition from outside. <clears throat> the first opposition you dealt with was, appears to have been inside. People who weren't sure they wanted to do all this. The first is two guys, Sambalat and Tobiah, are teasing them. They're trash talking them, saying, you know, they've started building. And they said, a fox could run up on top of your wall and knock it over. You know, this is the lamest thing you ever saw. And so they're teasing them. When that doesn't work, in terms of getting them disheartened to demoralizing them so they won't build the wall, they then threaten to attack them. Um, but they continue to work on rebuilding the wall. They refuse to be, to be uh, Put down. In fact, we have this description that Nehemiah assigned part of the workers with swords and bows and shields to be guards. So he has to establish guards. And at one point, he says those who were who were carrying the Carthage people were carrying with one army, carrying a sword in the other, and they were prepared to defend themselves. And a significant part of the workforce was having to be dedicated to just being the guards. And they would assign night guards and the whole thing, um, veladors, to night watchmen. To, to take care, make sure that things weren't going to be destroyed or they weren't going to be attacked. We then come to uh, Nehemiah as the governor is not only rebuilding the walls, but he also deals with some of the uh, social and economic problems. The people who are working on these walls, they start to tell Nehemiah when they realize he's a good guy, that all of the other bosses before you got here were taxing us to the point that they now own our land, they own our fields. We're not even able to produce our own food. Um, we're in heavy debt because of the heavy taxation. Um, so Nehemiah, the governor, cancels all debts. And he tells the people who had been in charge before him that you need to return the land and the property and the, you know, the capability to earn their own living back to all those people. And they do. So he rebalances the social order economically. And then we have an unselfish example of Nehemiah. As the governor, Nehemiah had a right to claim the food of the king's table, is how they describe it, which means he had a right to rich rations from the king. He didn't have to pay for anything. But instead, he refused that, and he invited large numbers of people to live off of him, that he paid for personally. All these people eating at his table, and it gives a description of all the food that, that was being fed to these people that Nehemiah paid for. And that was his way of saying, you guys who were running things before, you were taking all this stuff for yourself. I'm not even taking what's legally mine. Instead, what I have, I'm giving to everybody else. And so he was an example in that regard. Um, we then have the walls get rebuilt despite opposition. There are, they keep inviting, in fact it happens four times, they invite Nehemiah to come to a meeting and he knows that they want to get him off alone to kill him. Because if they get rid of Nehemiah, then you know, the spark is gone. So, and he keeps refusing. He's smarter than that. Well, then they hire false prophets. In fact, one of them is a woman, <coughs> prophetess, uh, Noadia, who prophesies failure and that he's not a man of God, that, that Nehemiah is not a man of God, etc. They hire these false prophets. Despite all of that, they finish the wall in 52 days. So you see all of this opposition that Nehemiah and the others have to confront. 
Then Nehemiah uh, makes a list of the exiles. Provisions for the protection of Jerusalem. Again, they still had guards. There had to be people responsible ongoing, even though the walls back up now. And he discovers the list of original returnees under Zerubbabel. So he's got kind of a you know, census kind of document there. They break them all up, delineate who they are, and they then do resettlement of the exiles. Just like when Joshua took the Israelites into the Holy Land the first time after they had conquered it, they divided it up according to family size and needs. Well, with that list that he uh, discovered of the original exiles, Nehemiah does the same thing. And again, he does it equitably so that everybody has sufficient property to live in and take care of themselves. We then have a retelling, you know, we come back around and we get the, the story of Ezra coming again, just as we'd already been told this earlier in the book of Ezra. Ezra comes to preach and revival breaks out. He gives a public explanation of the scriptures. They, they experience the Feast of the Tabernacles. They go through a day of fasting and confession and prayer. The people agree to a binding agreement. They give us a list in here of all the people who agreed to this agreement, that they were going to be obedient to the Lord, and all the provisions of that agreement, that they are going to obey the, the, the law. That they, Now that Ezra is there preaching it, they're all going to go along with it. We then are given descriptions of the residents of Judah and of Jerusalem, and we have lists of the residents by tribe. Now by this time, by the way, I should say, when the, um, when the Israelites were in exile, there were only two tribes and Levites represented. Okay. So there was not nearly as much emphasis on tribe from the exile on, because most of the tribes were gone. You didn't, that wasn't a, you didn't delineate things that way anymore. Instead, there's more of a reference to clans and family groups, because you had tribe, and then under that clan, and then a family group. Uh, and so more clan and family group emphasis. So we talk about, it talks about the residents of Jerusalem by it actually talks about ben, the Benjamites and the Levites, etc. But for the most part, it's talking about clan names. And then the residents of Judah, meaning outside Jerusalem, in the area that, that they control. <coughs> then a list of priests and the dedication of the wall. Priests and Levites from the first return are identified. There's a dedication of the wall in Jerusalem and regulations of temple offerings and services. You see, all of this is a getting organized thing. And that's Nehemiah's great strength. He was a business administrator. He's making sure that all of this is set up so that it should be able to run smoothly the way it had been originally under the temple. And if you think about it, with the 12 tribes and the Levites being responsible for temple worship and various parts of various family groups or clans of the Levites being responsible for certain things, either direct temple service, etc., etc., there had been great organization before. Well, Nehemiah is reestablishing a lot. Um, and then he leaves, after 12 years in Jerusalem, he goes back to Susa for a period of time. And when he comes back, he's shocked at, how, at what all these people have been doing in his absence. Mixed marriages are happening again, after Ezra has already dealt with that. We have Tobiah, as I say, he's been, the priest, high priest has moved this guy. I don't know if he's a brother-in-law or a cousin, but he's moved him, taken stuff out of some of the places in the temple where they, they say, where they... Uh, stored grain and various other things that were necessary for the maintenance of the temple and that people brought as, as contributions that needed to be distributed to the Levites, etc. Um, and moved the guy in there. And so Nehemiah comes back and goes, what have you guys been doing while I was gone? So he arrives back. One of the first things he does is he throws Tobiah out on his ear and says, no, you don't get to live free in the temple. That's not what this is for. So they got him out of there and they moved all the stuff back in that was supposed to be there. And he then continued with reorganizing and reforming. He, he made sure the offerings for the temple staff were being distributed. The, people, the, the priests and others who were supposed to serve the temple weren't being given their allotment of food and stuff. And so they had left and had gone back out in the fields to work. Because they said, we're going to starve to death if we stay here. So Nehemiah cleans all that up and makes sure that they're getting what they're supposed to get so they'll be there and, and uh, serving. There were a lot of abuses to the Sabbath. People were bringing cartloads of stuff into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day and selling it, very much against the law. He uh, says, we're not going to do that anymore, and he orders the people responsible for the walls and gates to close the gate before the Sabbath starts, not let anybody in. Well, people start coming up during the Sabbath and camping out right outside the gates. So Nehemiah says, you do this again, you're going to answer to me. I will personally, you know, I will take you in hand. Meaning, I will physically deal with you if you don't, if you come back again. So people stopped abusing the Sabbath. 
The mixed marriages got dealt with as they had with uh, Ezra. And then there was the provision of wood and first fruits for the temple uh, organization. That is the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Any questions about any of that? Yes. Was Ezra and Nehemiah in the same place at the same time, or they were sequential? Um, the um, Ezra was first. Actually, Zer the three main characters here are Zerubbabel, right. and then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. Okay. Now, um, Ezra and Nehemiah overlap, though, and that's why we get we get Ezra's reform. Then we get the story of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls, and then we get retold the details of Ezra's reforms. Okay, so they did overlap with one another, but but it, in, in terms of their appearance in Jerusalem, it was Zerubbabel, uh, Shezbazar, which I, again I think it's the same person, and then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. Okay. Other questions about that? The importance is this re-established the foundation, not just of the temple, but of the Jewish people as the people of God. Critically important. And from here, they go on for the next 500 years. You know, the, the last of the prophets was one of the post-exilic prophets. You now we have um, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Malachi was the last of the prophets. And so one of the things that happened is because there had been so much of a development of an emphasis on prayer and on study, that it, and so they, they actually a rediscovery of the law, you know, Ezra was partly responsible for that, a rediscovery of the law that in the absence of a prophetic voice in Israel, you know, Judah, they sort of reclaimed the, the name Israel after that, um, because they're one, only one nation again. The, in the absence of a prophetic voice in Israel for 450 years after Malachi, um, the emphasis was on the study of the word and of, of obedience to the law. And it was over that period of time that you get people, because they weren't hearing the word of God coming from prophets, they got so focused on the law that, you know, what happened, they did the same thing that theologians always do when they, when they start focusing too much on the details, and that is they started adding and adding and adding, coming up with different interpretations, etc. Until the time, 450 years after all of this, that you get the, the Pharisees acting in the way they did um, that Jesus had to deal with, the very legalistic, detail-oriented kind of stuff. But in that same period of time, in the 300s, you get Alexander the Great conquering the whole known world and teaching everybody to speak Greek, and you get the Sadducees were primarily the Hellenized Jews. They were the ones that, that had gone more in the direction of Alexander and the Greek thinking, and so they denied a lot of the, of the biblical truths. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. They didn't believe in a lot of that stuff. And so you had the Sadducees that were sort of following the Greek philosophy after, after Alexander, you had the Pharisees who had pursued this focus on the, the scripture and the law during the period of time after the last prophet Malachi up until the time of Jesus. And those were the two major parties that were in conflict, conflict with each other. Um, so we then see the picture for the next 450 years. Yes? So they believed that they still believed Jesus was coming. Both of the they believe the Messiah. Well, the Messiah. actually, the, the Sadducees were not real keen on that. I mean, the reason being, the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of Moses. Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They did not hold the rest of the, of the Old Testament, of this Hebrew Bible, as being equal to the Word of God. Well, most of the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah occur in the prophets, not in the law, not in the Pentateuch. And so there was not nearly the kind of emphasis or expectation on that. And that's why they could have such different beliefs, is they discarded most, they did not believe in or emphasize most of what the Hebrew Bible was, whereas the Pharisees believed all of it. The law, the prophets, and the writings were all God's word, and you had to pay attention to all of it. So that's why they had some theological differences. And once you understand those differences, a lot of the things that you read in the New Testament make a lot more sense. Like when Paul gets arrested you know, in Jerusalem before he's taken to Rome, and they take him out, you know, take him away from the Jews who are beating him up, the Romans do it. When they bring him back to the Sanhedrin to sort of testify with the Romans standing there, the first thing out of Paul's mouth is, I've been arrested, I'm standing here uh, in trial because I preached the resurrection from the dead. Which the Pharisees believed in and the Sadducees didn't. 
Well, the Pharisees start agreeing, we like him, he's a good guy. And the Sadducees said, no, kill him, grab him. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees started yelling at each other, and it became such a riot that the Romans had to take Paul out. So he didn't get tried before the Sanhedrin. But that doesn't make sense unless you understand the historic, the, the doctrinal differences between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, both of which are historical phenomena. The Sadducees following the Greek influence and Greek philosophy of, uh, of Alexander, after Alexander. The Sadducees being a product of the, the post-exilic, post-prophetic period where there was such an emphasis on you know, the detail of the law. Um, and so all of that, all of that's linked to the history of this stuff. So those two groups came out of the teachings from the synagogues, and that's how they formed. Well, to a great extent, yeah. I mean, the temple was back by then. The temple, the temple existed. And there were Levites, there were scribes, there you know, teachers of the law, and all of that. But the emphasis on studying the word and you know, prayer and community and all that from the synagogue movement had happened during the exile. Yes. But then it was after all of that that Philip that. Uh, Alexander came along and influenced the Greek thinking. Bob? Where did the rabbis fit into the Pharisee Sadducee picture? Well, the, um, there were rabbis from both schools because the rabbis would have come from a Levitical tradition. I mean, the, the formal rabbis. Anybody could be a teacher, and that's all rabbi means. Rabbi means teacher. Uh, the rabbi, the movement of rabbis, came up during the synagogue period. It came up really really grew during the exilic period, when you didn't have priests. So in lieu of a priest, who was a Levite who was responsible for running the temple, you had rabbis who were teachers. Again, the synagogue was about learning, right? Study. It was about prayer. Somebody to lead that. And so the rabbis did that. They were just teachers. But they were even itinerant rabbis. That's why when Jesus goes to Nazareth, they say, come, you know, read, read the scroll, talk to us. Because itinerant rabbis were usually welcomed in. So rabbis were teachers. During the time between the end of the prophetic period, Malachi, the rabbis were active in the in the temple, but there also were rabbis out in the countryside as well. Um, and they didn't have to be. They could be, but they didn't have to be from the Levitical tribes. Okay. So rabbis kind of replaced the priestly function during the exile, and then continued with that once they got back to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple. And remember, the temple that Zerubbabel and the others built was apparently pretty lame. You know, that actually, if you read Haggai Zechariah, that they're, they're grieving over what a pitiful example of a temple this is compared to what Solomon had built. And then Herod comes along and completely rebuilds the temple. In fact, some people say instead of there being two temples, there actually were three because Herod pretty much started all over again and built a spectacular temple, rivaling the one that Solomon had built. Um, but um, you'll, you'll, if you read about this, these kinds of things, they'll talk about the first temple period. And the second temple period. The first temple period is from Solomon to the destruction by the Babylonians. Okay, Solomon built it, the Babylonians destroyed it. The second temple period uh, is technically is from Zerubbabel, but more people think about that as being Herod, you know, and you know, from Herod to AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the second temple. Chris? The people who, st who didn't go back, you know, in, in Persia and all, did they continue on? I mean, in other words, did the synagogue system there even continue from there, or did it, it sort of decline? Um, it continued. In fact, one of the things you need to realize is the majority of the Jewish people did not go back because they had been three generations probably outside, you know. And so, do you feel a link to wherever your great great grandparents came from? You know, very, we don't very, very much anymore. They'd established their homes, they learned a new language, the people spoke Aramaic, which was a version of Chaldean, the Babylonian language, rather than Hebrew as their everyday language. Uh, that was true even of the ones who came back, and that continued for hundreds of years after that. They continued to speak Aramaic as the day-to-day -day language. And so a lot of them stayed there, but all of this Babylonian captivity, the, a, a lot of them running off to Egypt, some of them fleeing elsewhere, was the the diaspora, the spreading out of the Jewish people, which is why you had Jewish communities, and they tended to cluster in communities, in, you know, uh, in Thebes, in various other cities in Egypt, before even Alexandria was a city, because Alexander the Great founded the city of Alexandria. You had them spread all over Asia Minor. You had them in Europe. You know, there's actually a chart that I've used in one of, my, one of the classes I taught on the Steps of Faith that has lines going everywhere 
from, from Israel, the, the area of the, the Palestine Levant, showing may, just the major um, routes that the Jews took. Lots of Jews went to Spain. And so you ended up actually having uh, you know, Ashkenazi Jews versus the Sephardic Jews. Mm -hmm. Sephardic Jews being this sort of uh, Spanish influence kind of stuff. And, you, and all of that was because of spreading out the diaspora. And so the idea that, that, that all of them didn't go back is not surprising. Because by that time, they were Jews everywhere. And there was, they had their own communities everywhere. And in this case, they were strongly influenced by the Babylonian culture and the Babylonian language, or version of it, Aramaic. Um, and so a lot of them stayed where they were. They didn't go back. Um, and yet always there has been, for religious Jews, this idea of return. It may not be yet, but eventually the return. In fact, the Jewish definition of salvation is return from exile. It's, that's how, how, what they think salvation is, is that ultimately, eventually, God will allow them to return from, what, from their exile. And they're all in exile. In fact, Jews used to, all the way up through the founding of the State of Israel, one of the common expressions, if you met a Jew in Europe or you know, anywhere, um, when they said goodbye, the goodbye would be next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem meant eventually we will be back. And that was before, before the, you know, the return and the founding of the, the nation of Israel in the 40s. Next year in Jerusalem, there's always been that sense that they will return. Even though when they had an opportunity, not all of them did, because I own a house here, you know, the market's not good, it's hard to sell, my kids are in school, you know, I've still got payments on the minivan, I don't think I can go back to Jerusalem right now. All right? It's the same kind of motivations we have. Very human kinds of things. So where's the story of Ruth and Moaz? Is it fitting in this? No, it's earlier than this. It's okay. earlier. Yeah, that's earlier. Ruth and Boaz is before the, the uh, destruction. And it's, it, yeah, th that occurs before this. The book of Esther, on the other hand, which we'll look at next week in the first hour, is exactly during this time. Okay. Esther is the queen of Persia. One of the queens. They have multiple wives. But she is married to one of the kings of Persia, and the whole story is revolved around revolves around that. And it's Esther is like my favorite story in the whole Bible. Even though the book, the book of Esther almost didn't make it in the Bible for the simple reason that the book of Esther never mentions God. There's no reference to God. But it is so much the story of God preserving his people against all odds that they just couldn't deny that this is this is one that needs to be. You know, this is God's message to us, even if he doesn't get mentioned in it. So it is. It is my favorite story. Other questions? Yes. Um, as a small example, the Sephardic Jews mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't they have intermarried with the Spanish? Well, they did some, and that's why that's why Sephardic Jews tend to be darker complexion, darker. because they're more, they're more Mediterranean. The Ashkenazi Jews tend to be more European. I mean, they're they're located more in Central Europe. Scandinavia, etc., and so there is a complexion difference. Well, so they're not really pure Jews. Well, um, pure Jew. Uh, <laughs> again, the idea is that if it, if they were um, if Jewish women married um, Gentile men, they would have Jewish children, and they would be considered Jews. Jews, yes. It's and over a period of time, they could still be considered legally considered fully Jews, but not. You know, but but have other other bloodlines yes. and different complexion. Yes. The problem that they had here with marrying foreign women, it wasn't so much that you know that they it's they married people who worshipped other gods, yeah. and so it was almost more a cultural problem mm -hmm. than it was a, a a genetic problem. Okay, because the genetics are pretty simple. If the mother's Jewish, Jewish. there are Jewish children. Yes. And so that tended not to be a problem. But you realize that in, in virtually every case, like they put away strange wives, it wasn't that Jewish women were marrying Hebrew men, and, and because that would be, or uh, non-Hebrew men, because they'd be having Jewish children, that would create a problem. Jewish men were marrying non-Jewish women, which means their children technically were not considered Jewish. That was the problem. That's why you don't hear a big issue being made of the fact that, you know, that Jewish women, some Jewish women might have married um, non-Jewish men. Nobody mentions that because their children would still have been Jewish. And the women were influence, influencing the men to worship their gods more so than the other way around. You'll notice that even though Solomon was the king of everything, 
The women weren't following his gods, he was following theirs. All right? Um, where's the real power here? <laughs> so, and, and so there, that, that's where you get the problem. It was the fact that if they married foreign women, their children were not Jewish. Okay, Joan first. Yeah, I read in either the book or my Bible commentary, um, but somewhere when I was reading this, uh, I read that the, the reason that the women went away with their children is because at that time in that culture, children belonged to the mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that fits in what you're saying here is that the children wouldn't be considered Jewish. Right. They belonged to their mother. And when the mothers left, they had the right to take their children with them right. because they belonged to them and their people. And they weren't uh, Jewish, yeah. yeah. So not, not to the fathers. The fathers didn't have a claim on them. Because you're okay. oh, sorry. Uh, let me go to the floor. It's been holding hand up, so. Uh, today with DNA, has any of this changed now? Or knowing that, uh, does it, is it still just the mother? Well, it's, it's not it's not a technical genetic issue. It's a traditional genetic issue, okay. um, and so obviously this was a this was path they followed before they had any clue about genetics uh, in terms of the people. And yet that, that was the instruction who God that God who does not do genetics gave them. Now they are able now to identify um, you know Jewish elements. I I I did. A, what I thought was a very cool thing, National Geographic, they're not the only ones who does it, they do the genealogy, or the, the, uh, the DNA analysis, you know, and they'll tell you what percentage of your DNA is Jewish, and I was like 3% or something. You're part Neanderthal. Yeah, I'm 3% Neanderthal. <laughs> but that's lower than average. Uh, the average is like, for Westerners is like 4%. But it tells you where you, know, where you came from, uh, basically, and it, it will track because the, there are very distinct markers for Jewish DNA. As I said, the genetics of Jewish people, the, the obvious example of that is the fact that there are diseases that only Jewish people can get, tay sachs for instance. Uh, and so there are very clear genetic differences for Jewish people. Um, but Well, speaking to the purity of the Jewish race, there was so much intermarriage down through the years. One wonders how really pure the Jewish race was. Mm -hmm. Well, again, that's, it's not a genetic issue. It's more a cultural, traditional issue. Um, and again, God in his wisdom, and we see this demonstrated, God knew that um, a non-Jewish man and a Jewish woman, that the kids were going to be raised Jews. Whereas a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman, they're probably going to be raised as Moabites, or Ammonites, or Amorites, or you know whatever, Philistines. Um, that's simply the way families work. And so it was not, it was not, we can't think of this as being a scientific genetic thing. If they have over, you know, 17.7% Jewish genes, it was purely a matter of what was the practical, and God in his wisdom knew the practical reality of that, which we see demonstrated in these stories, um, is that, that if, if the mothers were Jewish, then the Jewish culture and, and history and worship was going to continue. If the women were not Jewish, Everything is going to go crazy. All right. Yes. Well, logically, you know who the child was born from. You don't always know who the father is. So that's true too. That's probably where that came from. Yeah, there's an assurance there. Uh -huh. And I mean, how many of you all know men who have converted religion for their wives? Versus, how many times has a woman converted her religion for the man? I mean, it happens. But I've known a lot more instances where you know where the the man becomes Catholic or because of his wife, you know, or becomes Methodist because of his wife, or, you know, whatever. Um, and that's not to say it doesn't happen the other way, but in my experience, it seemed to be much, much more, and that's completely consistent with what, we're, what we read here. Mike? The, uh, there's, there's a genetic marker from the sons of the descendants of Aaron down to the Cohen's, mm -hmm. you know, the priests, uh, and, and they've been able to track to modern genetics and track back. Yeah, and the, I said I said this recently that Cohen is one of the names that we do know is a Levitical name because one of the clans of the Levites were the Kohites, Cohen, Co, Kohites, um, and it's it's a derivative of that name. And so we do know because the Levites as a tribe continued more distinctly; they were always more distinctly delineated than any of the other tribes. And there were Levites that continued in the south even after the northern tribes were, because they didn't have his property in the north, they were everywhere. 
particular, they were oriented around Jerusalem, which was in Judah in the south. So they were not included in the lost tribes when the Assyrians you know, uh, spread out the Jewish people in the north. So the Levites remain one of the most distinctive of all the tribes known. Yeah? There's another thing that's interesting is that large numbers of Sephardic Jews settled in Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, and there's lots and lots of descendants of Sephardic Jews here in Mexico that don't even know that they're, they're Sephardic. Yeah, well, and you had, you had a large Jewish population in Ethiopia, you know, the Phalangist Jews. Mm -hmm. And it was like 30 years ago now, or 35 years ago, that, that the nation of Israel mounted this large repatriation campaign where they, they paid for any of these Jewish people in Ethiopia, Phalangist Jews, they paid for them to move to Israel because they, you know, they demonstrate their Jewish blood. It's something that the Ethiopians would say, thank you, Solomon. <laughs> and, and, and the Queen of Sheba, right? Again, I love that line that, that when Queen of Sheba left, Solomon gave her more than she had brought in. <laughs> so, and the legend is, it's not in scripture, but the legend is she, when she left, she was pregnant. Um, so, any other questions or comments? This is all kind of fun. Yeah, knowing Solomon. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will see you uh, next week for Esther and the final exam. If anybody does not have a copy of the study notes, I have them. They're online, too. You can get them where I have them for you. And I hope you can all go to Arabia.